Welcome to Enterprise. Thank you. Welcome to Enterprise Tuesday. Um, I'm just doing a few housekeeping things. So my name's Shafir Mahmood. I work um, at the Entrepreneurship Centre, um, uh, working as a partnership lead on the education side. Um, so that's um, that's myself. Um, what I'd like to do is just do, like I said, a few housekeeping things. So um, I'd like to first of all introduce. Well, I won't introduce. I'll leave Philip to do all the introductions to the panel. But we have a superb panel this evening, and I'm sure it'll be a really fruitful evening. Um, if there's a fire, we don't have any um, drills tonight, so if there is a fire, please just leave from the doors that you came in through and convene outside the main building. Um, if you have laptops and phones, could you please turn them to silent? Uh, we are live streaming as well. Um, so another, another point is if you are um, asking questions, and please speak into the mic clearly so that the audience, the global audience, um, can, can hear you clearly. Um, so further from that, I'd like to introduce um, Philip, who's a PhD student here at Cambridge, specialising in metabolic and cardiovascular disorders. Um, Philip has previously also read molecular and uh, cellular biochemistry at, at Oxford. Um, he's uh, president of the Cambridge Consulting Network um, and a graduate of uh, Enterprise Tech and most recently Enterprise Tech Star. So um, welcome to, to you and, and over to you, Philip. Well, thanks. Thanks for that lovely introduction, Shafia. And as I said before, I will be the chair for tonight, and it's my pleasure to introduce the panel. So first, starting with Malcolm. Malcolm leads the physical uh, sciences team at Cambridge Enterprise, working to help researchers commercialize technologies from the schools of physical sciences and technology. His team provides support to researchers, taking their ideas on their first steps towards commercialization, either by licensing, licensing to existing companies or by creating new spin-out companies. Prior to joining Cambridge Enterprise, Malcolm spent 18 years in industry, initially as an engineer, before moving into sales, marketing, and new product development. Next is Ed. So Ed is a published composer, having written music for a number of choral groups and theatre. He is also an entrepreneur, having founded Juke Deck, an AI music composition company, which created more than half a million pieces of original music. In 2019, it was acquired by ByteDance, where Ed is currently running the AI Lab in Europe. Michal is head of business development at Helix, a biotech company using AI to develop novel treatments for rare diseases. Apart from leading the business development team and their activities, she has also supported two consecutive rounds of investments with the Helix CEO. After a successful research career in the fields of psychology and human metabolism, Michal completed an MBA with a focus of li in life sciences, as well as gained over 10 years of commercial experience, ranging from management consultancy, technology transfer, and pharmacy business development. And last is Stephen, who is a patent and trademark attorney with nearly 20 years of experience in advising clients of all sizes on their intellectual property strategies and requirements. His relatively rare dual qualification to handle both patents and trademarks means that he is ideally placed to assist startups and scale-ups who are unsure of what IP they might have and what it might generate. With a background in physics, Stephen handles IP in a wide range of engineering and IT fields, including telecommunications, computer software, and medical devices. So now, obvious, obviously, I will hand it over to the experienced panel to give a short introduction of themselves, as well as, as, well as outline either their views, views or interesting experiences on today's topic of commercializing research and protecting IP. So, Malcolm, please. Okay, thank you. Yeah. So. Um, I think I'll start by giving the, the brief introduction to Cambridge Enterprise for those who don't know what we are. So Cambridge Enterprise is there to help University of Cambridge employees and students make their ideas more commercially successful. So if you think of the university, the university creates knowledge, then it disseminates it by teaching, by publication, and sometimes by commercial means. And when commercial means are the right way to do it, Cambridge Enterprise is there to help. That's basically what Cambridge Enterprise is about. Um, my team um, is, um, we, we see ideas from the very early stage. So people come to us at the very beginning of when they're thinking about commercialising. So um, there's three points I want to make, really. Um, the first one is we're talking about deep science here. So people, deep science is really interesting. So people come to us to talk about deep science. And it's really, we talk about science. It's great. It's brilliant. Um, so the first thing we've got to do is step away from the science and think about the value proposition. What is this going to do for somebody? Who are the customers? What value is it going to provide to them? And why is it better than the competition? And 
it's often quite tricky to get people to move away from thinking about their science and how good the science is um, to thinking about that value proposition. And that's the first thing you've got to do. The second point is there's a lot of ways of commercializing ideas. Um, and there's a tendency to think, oh, I must form a spin-out company. Um, and sometimes that's the right way to do it, but very often it isn't. Um, collaboration with existing companies is in many ways a much easier way to do it. A lot of the infrastructure is already there. You don't have to start from the beginning. Um, so we tend to look, if we can, um, to collaborate with a, an existing company rather than create a new one. But of course, there are many situations where creating a new company is the right thing to do. So having thought about your value proposition and the sort of route in which you want to go, that's the point at which you start to think, OK, how do I get this raw idea to the point at which someone is going to put a lot of money into it? Um, and that's what my team does, is thinks about the different ways in which you can add value to that proposition. Part of it is protecting the intellectual property. Part of it is developing prototypes. A lot of it is talking to customers. So there's a big variety of things to be done to help take it from that raw idea, that science, to something that's a viable commercial proposition. I think I'll stop there. OK. Next, Dad. Great. Thanks so much. It's lovely to be here. Um, I'm rather embarrassingly not a scientist at all. I don't know what I'm doing talking about deep science. Um, so apologies if you weren't expecting to hear a musician talk. Um, but uh, what we did at Duke Deck, I, I do in fact think of as, as deep science. Music can be very scientific, and that's kind of what made me um, made me start Duke Deck, which was the company I started. Um, so, so Duke Deck was a was an AI music composition company. I actually started working on it in 2010. Um, and we, so we were the first, you may have heard about AI composition more recently in the news, we were the first company in the space. Um, and over the course of uh, really eight and a half years or so, we, uh, we, we built this AI composition technology that wrote music, original music from scratch. Um, and ultimately, we used neural networks to do so. Um, we grew to a team of about 20 people, um, and we, our music was used by... Um, bunch of companies like Bloomberg, Coca-Cola, all these people. Um, and yeah, we, we had sort of millions of pieces of music be made using our system. And ultimately, last year, we sold the company to ByteDance, um, who, who run TikTok, which you're more likely to have heard of. Um, and I think we were asked tonight to talk, talk about kind of a few things. Um, the people involved in this kind of process, uh, the, the funding, um, how, to prote how to protect IP in deep science companies, and, and kind of how to build value. And I think... On the people side, um, the, the first thing I'd say is I started Duke Deck on my own, and that was a huge mistake. Um, I, I did it on my own for about four years, and it was just absolute chaos. Um, it is, I was tempted to think that, I mean, well, there were a bunch of reasons I did so. Frankly, back in 2010, you really couldn't convince anyone to, um, to join you in a mission to get AI to compose music. Um, everyone I spoke to was like, you're crazy. Um, and uh, but, so that was very hard work. And actually, but I got lucky enough a few years in to, um, to the company, um, I, a good friend of mine actually from, we were both at King's here down the road, and he was working at Google striking video partnerships. And I, over dinner one night, I told him what I was doing. And he said, well, I'll, I'll join you. Um, and so we started having some great Google free lunches. Um, make, take advantage of that if you can. Um, they're brilliant. Um, and, uh, and, and planning the, the business over lunch and that sort of thing. And, uh, ultimately, he, he jumped ship and uh, joined me. And that, that was the first thing I learned about deep tech people, which is really ignoring the fact that it's, it's, it's deep science. You know, finding so I mean, I was lucky to work with such a good friend, but finding that co-founder with whom you can go through the highs and the lows, because there'll be many lows, is incredibly vital. Um, the other thing I'd say about people is that actually, I think you're lucky in deep science in that um, it can really inspire people. Um, you know, if you're working on something, there will be a, maybe a small subset of people, but there will be people who are incredibly passionate about that field. That's what we found. Um, you know, we were, we were kind of the only company doing AI music, and it meant that there were a small number of researchers who we went and chatted to, um, and they just couldn't believe that they could actually get a job in this field. Um, and, you know, and we basically hired all of them. Um, and I would, um, I, I, you know, I, I think that's a real strength of deep science companies. Um, 
Funding, what would I say about funding? Um, I mean, Cambridge Enterprise were our first backers. They're amazing. I'm not just saying that because Malcolm's here. Um, they're absolutely brilliant. Um, I, I got very lucky, actually. I, I, I actually, I knew nothing. I didn't mean to start a company. Um, it was a total accident. I, it, this was kind of a, a, an interest project. And then I ran out of time and money and thought, I'd, this, I'd better make this a company. Um, and I wrote to about 50 investors, and about 48 of them didn't reply. Um, but Cambridge Enterprise, uh, a guy who's actually not with Cambridge Enterprise anymore, but the, the guy at the time I wrote to, he'd actually worked in this field before. And I didn't realize that. And it was incredibly lucky. And, and so he got me in. He said, oh, show me what you've done. And he said, actually, that's pretty impressive. And ultimately, I got in front of the investment committee, and Cambridge Enterprise invested and were incredibly supportive. But I think what I learned from that, I, I, I got lucky. But I think what you can learn from that is that it's incredible. There's money out there. It's incredibly important to figure out where to look for it and who to speak to. You know, there will be investors who are incredibly keen um, to speak to you because they actually understand your field. And I think that's the key when, when trying to find funding. And I got lucky there. Um, on patents, uh, I won't take much longer. But on, on patents, uh, we 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 um, we did a few patents. Um, I actually, in my first pitch to Cambridge Enterprise, I don't think you were there. Were you there at the time? No. In my first pitch to Cambridge Enterprise. Um, uh, had on the board. We didn't have any money yet, so we hadn't filed any patents. But um, I, I had spoken to a, pat to, a, to a patent attorney, and I'd gone in and explained kind of what we were doing. And they basically said, OK, you know, there's something here. And so I put their face on the slide, and that showed Cambridge Enterprise that this was serious, that there was something there. But we hadn't actually patented it yet. And you know, getting those patents early on is incredibly important. Um, you know, I think that, showed, that, that kind of helped Cambridge Enterprise, I think, take us seriously. Um, I, I would say I look at patents like, you know, like the kind of foundations of a house. Um, you know, when you're, ultimately, we sold the company. When, you know, when you're buying the house, it's not, it's not for the foundations, but they have to be there. You know, you, you, the patents are incredibly important. Ultimately, they're, you know, they're almost a bit of an extra. You know, the, the real thing that someone's going to maybe buy your company for is, you know, it might be the tech, it might be the users, it might be how the company's doing in general, it might be the team. Um, but the patents are an incredibly important foundation, so do get them in place. That's my opinion. I'd love to hear what Stephen thinks. Um, and yeah, finally, I suppose on you know there, there's a question uh, in the in the sort of blurb here about kind of value in deep science companies, and I do think this is really important. I think one of the things we did well at Duke Deck, uh, and we did many things badly, and any company will, and you will you will all find that. Um, one of the things we did well was was actually built value by explaining to non-scientific people what we were doing. And this is incredibly important. We spent a lot of time um, you know, uh, uh, explaining what we were doing. Actually, Claire came up to me earlier and said, oh, I saw your, um, I saw your rap on YouTube. Um, and, and she is right. There is, there is, there is a rap uh, of me on YouTube. I, I, there's a video of me in a TechCrunch Disrupt competition. Um, and it was, there were about 20 companies pitching their startups. And we thought, how can we get noticed? And so we did our pitch in the form of a rap. I'm very bad at rapping. But it went fine. And we won the competition, not because our tech was any better than anyone else's, because the judges were bored of everyone else's. Um, and uh, I, at least I think that's why it was. And, um, you know, and, and so and my wife did, in fact, forget, uh, forbid me from ever doing that again, uh, which is a good idea. Um, but, but, but this is really important. And actually, you know, towards the end of the company, we started doing some press in China, um, just because we got the inbound interest. And we always took press incredibly seriously, getting in front of people and explaining why, you know, why you're doing what you're doing and what it means. Um, and that's really important in deep science, I would say. Uh, and I think that worked out for us in that it, it kind of raised our exposure. And that's a very important thing to do. So yeah, that, that's kind of how I think about deep um, science companies. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for that, Michal. Um, thank you. So first of all, thank you very much for the invitation. I'm really happy to be here. Um, I think the last time I was um, in Enterprise Tuesday is um, uh, 10 years ago. Uh, when I was finishing my postdoc. So, um, and looking back, I think it was such a unique opportunity for me to know about business coming out of science. So, fantastic. Um, so, yes, so tonight I want to talk about IP uh, and commercialization of research um, in a context of. So, I was uh, working at Cambridge Enterprise uh, with Malcolm but on a life science part. So that was my first exposure to, um, to commercialization of IP, and that was a great experience. Um, and um, uh, joining Helix as head of business development, of course, I want to talk about what it means. Uh, Helix is a startup, was a startup, growing really fast. Um, and the initial uh, technology is, is inspired from what's happening in, what happened in the university in the lab of Andreas Bender. So I can talk about that. We have a different experience 
because uh, Helix was not uh, funded by Cambridge Enterprise, so it's an example of uh, you know another another route. Um, and also um, the IP that Helix is generating. So Helix is an AI company started as a pure tech company um, and evolved into a biotech company. So we use the AI uh, to generate treatments for rare diseases. And um, so we validated um, um, these treatments in vitro, in vivo, and generated uh, assets, pharmaceutical assets. And we, be we are becoming um, a real uh, biotech slash um, a pharma company. Um, so generating there our own IP in the in form of uh, pharmaceutical assets. So coming from uh, the university, IP there, and also generating IP. So I'm happy to take any questions that could uh, be related to that. Yep. OK, Stephen. OK, so um, about 20 years ago, I, I was last sitting in lecture theatres in Cambridge when I was studying here, um, doing natural sciences. Um, I don't have as quite as varied or maybe as exciting a background since then as um, some of my fellow panelists, uh, but I've been working as a patent and trademark attorney since then. And what I found is that I work for a very wide range of companies. They might be multinationals um, in very big industries. Uh, they might be universities. I've worked for a lot of different universities um, around the UK and around the globe. Um, but actually, what's, what's most fun in my job is working with the people at the, at the sort of cutting edge, the people who are coming up with new ideas that one day are, are going to revolutionize the world. Um, and it's about helping them, about helping them get to the position where they will be able to take that idea forward um, and that they will be able to uh, profit from it um, and they will be able to be successful from it. Um, and I think if there's one thing I want people to take away from tonight, uh, it's the idea that um, IP is not a one-size-fits-all for every company. You can't, you can't come along and um, say, I'm a startup, I want some IP protection. It's always going to be a different answer. But what is really important is at that early stage, um, as Ed was saying just now, it's very important to think about what you might have um, and think about what might be there, what might be protectable, and talk to someone about it, talk to someone who, who knows about it, whether that's um, Malcolm and his team at Cambridge Enterprise, whether that's a patent attorney, um, to find out what, what the possibilities are and what you ought to do. Um, because if you can do that at the early stage, that's a lot better than suddenly coming to it three years down the line uh, when perhaps some of your options have disappeared um, and you're running to catch up with, with what's going on. Um, so I really want to say sort of think about it at the outset. Uh, there are a lot of different options within IP. It's not all about patents. Um, certain companies, it'll be far more important that you get your brand protected, that you get uh, trademark rights sorted out. For other companies, actually going down trade secrets route is, uh, is a better route than going down patents. Um, so the options are there, but probably as, a, as an entrepreneur, as a scientist, you don't know what they are, um, but we're here and we're very willing to help you on, that, on the early stages of that trail. Okay. Thanks, Stephen. Thanks for everyone. So um, now we're going to move towards a few questions for myself and in between the panelists, if there are any. And then afterwards, we're going to take some questions from the audience as well. Uh, right back at you, Stephen, first, because um, as we were discussing before, I really want everyone to be at least at the kind of standard knowledge of what we mean when we talk about intellectual property. So if you can just give us like a, um, like a short encompass of what intellectual property might be and what are kind of the costs that kind of come with it in a nutshell, let's say. <laughs> Okay, um, how long is my piece of string? We have about an hour, so it should be fine. <laughs> um, so so there's, there's a slight background to this. I, I give some lectures on um, enterprise tech and enterprise tech star, and um, the IP lecture that I gave uh, to Philips Group on enterprise tech star, um, I, I got to slide three. It was an hour-long lecture. Um, I, got, I was still on slide three five minutes before the end of the hour because of the questions that they were, they were asking me. Uh, but in, in a nutshell, um, IP is a very sort of big basket into which there's a lot of different rights. Essentially, they are uh, rights that allow you to stop other people from doing something in relation to things that you have created. Um, those rights, um, and I'm not going to even try and name them all because there are, there are quite a lot out there and most of them won't be that significant for you. 
But broadly speaking, you have uh, patents, which is probably the one that most people have heard of in relation to IP rights. Patents protect technical ideas. They protect innovation, um, and their objective is to prevent people from doing things which are technically the same as what you've invented. The next right um, is design rights. Designs protect visual appearance. They protect predominantly the appearance of products, but increasingly that uh, goes into the computing space and the look and feel of an app, um, the look and feel of a website can all be protected. The visual aspects can be protected by designs. Uh, then you have copyright. Um, copyright, most people, is the IP right that actually, uh, in the wider public, most people have heard of. Um, copyright protects uh, your skill, your labor, and your effort that goes into creating some uh, generally artistic, in the very broad sense, not just the painting sense, uh, work that you've produced. Typically, um, that protects, um, obviously, the true artistic works, but the most relevant area um, for science companies that it protects is it does protect computer code. Um, and then slightly to one side, because it's not actually quite the same as the other rights, because it's slightly less intellectual in the intellectual property sphere, are trademarks. Trademarks protect brands, um, and what they do is they protect the value that you have in why customers choose you over any other company. Um, and the example I always use for, uh, for trademarks is uh, Deliveroo. Deliveroo is a very basic business model. You order food, they get it from the uh, people who make the food, and they deliver it to your door. I could go out there tomorrow and set up Deliveroo. I wouldn't get as many orders as Deliveroo do. And the reason that I wouldn't is because I'm not Deliveroo. I'm not called Deliveroo. They've built a brand that allows people to engage with it, that they know what they're going to get, they know the service they're going to get, they know the options that are there, and they know what's going to happen when they go there. So brands are, are incredibly important for all types of businesses in terms of building that customer relationship and keeping that customer relationship going forward. The other big difference between different kinds of intellectual property rights is whether you are talking about registered rights or unregistered rights. In a very broad sense, unregistered rights are things that allow you to, that come into existence simply because you've done it. And copyright is the prime example of this. Simply because you've written um, your essay, your dissertation, your thesis, that has copyright. Someone cannot come along and copy a substantial part of it. You don't have to do anything else to protect that copyright. The other rights, the registered rights, you actually have to do something. You have to make an application for them, and typically that will be examined at some level by a government body, uh, the patent office or the intellectual property office, uh, before you get a right in return for whatever you've given them uh, in your application. Obviously, the unregistered rights come into existence automatically. You don't have to pay for them. Uh, the registered rights, you do have to pay. You all, there is always a government fee, so in return for them doing the examination, you would have to pay a fee for that. And quite often, you will pay attorneys, like myself, like my colleagues, to help you with the application process, not just in terms of the form filling, but in terms of getting everything in the right place for that. Um, on the scale of things, uh, protecting a trademark, protecting a design is at the relatively cheap end of the scale for um, the, the smaller companies. You're talking of costs in the hundreds to low thousands of pounds to protect rights. Uh, patents do tend to, to build up much more on the cost of that. And in the very broad sense that sort of you're looking at uh, for filing a first patent application, it's uh, several thousand pounds, uh, but that's only the start of the process. Um, and so you will want commercial funding, hopefully secured through people like Cambridge Enterprise or through your investors before you get to the end of the, of, of the patenting process. So do you think I've covered everything? I think you've covered some of it, yes. Uh, that was definitely uh, a short one, but a colorful description, which we, I think everyone enjoyed. And it wasn't too long, so that's fine. Uh, continuing on from there, Ed, you kind of stumbled up on that how important it is uh, to have, like you kind of said that patents are kind of a house, like a foundation of a house. Mm. So how, uh, the next question is obviously for all of you, um, but I want to start with Ed, is uh, how important is um, intellectual property when it comes to a young startup or a young company? Yeah, that's. Um, I think my take on that is 
to, to be honest, I don't think it, it, it will be different for different companies. Um, you know, I, there's no one size fits all answer, I think. But for our company, to be honest, the most important thing, the most important reason for us to have these patents at the beginning was was almost to, to gain some credibility in a space that was very, very young and um, really, really, really that was hard to do serious due diligence on. Um, you know, I, and maybe that's because it was ultimately a music startup in a scientific world. But, you know, I mean, there, there had been previous work done in our field. How could one really tell, you know, whether what we'd done was better, um, you know, with when there are pretty much no experts in this field? I mean, there's one in America. Um, you know, although we're back in 2010, this was the case anyway. Um, so, so I think that was that was very helpful for us. Um, having, you know, having almost something to show. Apart from that, you just had a big long piece of code that I'd written um, that could produce some output, produce some musical output, and that was it. Um, so that was that was one thing, and, and that's probably not the answer for most people. But for us, it was almost, you know, building up, um, you know, some some kind of proof almost that what we were doing actually had technological merit. Um, you know, especially once these patents started getting through the entire process of being actually granted um, after they'd been examined and compared against other patents. Um, so I think that's that's maybe one one answer as to why it's important, but absolutely not the only one. Just a short question following up on that. Uh, you said that you kind of spoke to patent attorneys before coming to Cambridge Enterprise. Yes. Before, how did you know of the importance that you kind of have to have that on the slide? Um, I. I actually think that what happened, God, it was a long time ago. Um, but so I, and I, did, I don't keep a diary, so I might be wrong about this. But I think what happens, it, it happened is I, I started chatting to this guy, Mike, at Cambridge Enterprise. And I think he probably, I may be wrong, but I think he probably put me onto the idea of patents. And then I kind of went and chatted to some, and that was before I'd got funding. They were, they were very helpful early on, you know. Yeah. That's good. That's good. Michael? Um, yeah, I mean, let's remember what this intellectual property is for. We've, we've heard it's about stopping other people doing things. Um, someone is, if, if we're talking about things coming out of deep science, someone is going to spend a lot of money turning it from that into a product. Um, the person who's going to put that money in is going to want to have as much protection as possible to make sure that nobody else is going to come along and copy it. And intellectual property in the broadest sense is what gives that protection. And I, I do mean in the broadest sense. I mean patents at one end. I mean know-how at the other end. Um, and you've you know-how, know trade secrets. Um, obviously, you have to think about which way you do that. But people need that protection before they're going to put the money in. OK. Yeah, I think uh, in our case, it's interesting because um, AI algorithms, softwares, um, we didn't have any IP. We didn't have any protection. Uh, but we were very aware of it, and um, and we really had to come to the point where um, we could protect IP. So what we had initially was know-how, and we evolved and augment uh, the knowledge that existed so much and put so much know-how into how we use the AI um, that it, it was not reproducible, but it was not nothing registered. Um, but there was a lot of copyright in code, was there? Um, I don't think so. Okay. Uh, because it, the, the, reason, the reason is that it evolves so fast that mm. there was almost no point in protecting at each, uh, yeah. at, at each step. At, yeah. mm -hmm. and, 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 and that's uh, the value of, of, of the tech at Helix. It is evolving all the time, mm. still today. So there's no, no point in protection. However, the output and the use of the AI that we make is is IP as in drugs, um, new yeah. no novelty, drug IP. Mm -hmm. so. No, th thanks for that. And if we, you, you want to say something? No, I'm okay. okay. Yeah, so, so if, if, if we want to continue, uh, and we've, yes. heard, we've heard this, that um, we're getting on to Stephen, yes, but we've heard this, um, that you didn't even have anything, you had know-how, and then because it was evolving so quickly, uh, you didn't really know at what point you should start protecting something. Yeah. And I want to go to Stephen here a little bit because he's worked through, uh, obviously as a patent attorney, through a variety of yeah. different industries. So if we can kind of transition into a question more about what are the different challenges that you might get um, in the IP space, in protecting IP um, mm -hmm. from so different industries. Yeah, I, I think the fundamental point is that IP is a tool, it's a commercial tool, 
Um, it's, and it's about trying to protect what you've got uh, from other people doing the same. And generally, that's about protecting against two possibilities. One is the possibility of another startup like yourself coming along in the same space and stealing your market. Uh, maybe they're a little bit quicker. Maybe they've got a slightly better product. Uh, maybe they've got a slightly better advertising, whatever, whatever it is. So it, it's about dealing with that sort of competition. But it's also about dealing with the established players um, and making sure that you, your lovely new idea doesn't suddenly get picked up by mm. Google, Amazon, whoever, uh, who can throw m much more money and resources at it than you can and just do exactly the same thing. Um, and so what you, what you want your IP to do, whether, whether that's a patent, whether that's a, um, your know-how, keeping it secret, um, is to stop that copying from happening, to create those barriers to entry. Um, and that's what creates the value that, as Malcolm says, people will want to invest in um, and put their money behind to take it forwards. Now, what that is for a different industry, what that is for um, a, a, a biotech startup compared to what that is for an app developer is, is widely different. Um, and it will, be, it will be a mixture of different things. At, at the biotech, at the biochemistry end, you're probably looking very early on at patent protection because you have quite likely either a candidate or a way of identifying candidates um, for, for new drugs. Um, at, the, at the app developer end, you're probably never going to touch on the patents. Um, you're, you're trying to get first to market, you're trying to get some traction, you're trying to get a customer base um, and spread through word of mouth and shares and likes and everything. Um, and then, therefore, your brand's going to be far more important than anything else. Um, so I, it's been said a couple of times, there's no one size fits all. And across the different tech spaces, what will be most appropriate will vary considerably. I think it's, it's always interesting to look at the comparing at one end pharma and at the other end consumer electronics, where at the pharma end, a single patent can effectively be worth billions. Mm. Um, whereas in consumer electronics, you, know, you look at a, your mobile phone and I think of the number of patents there are covering that, and it's thousands. Uh, so a single patent has very little value in itself. It's huge piles of patents mm. that have value. Um, and those are the two extreme ends and in between there's a whole load of different industries with different approaches and there's different companies with different approaches within each of those industries um, uh, I spent 20 years in industry and never used a patent at all but <laughs> um, there you go so after that initial kind of IP is set up how do we then generate more value out of it we said we started a company we got some IP on it what to do now how do, how do we meet you know, can you talk yeah, a little so about, more case, about that um, the IP, uh, the initial uh, priority application is just the beginning. First of all, um, ah, there's something interesting that I'm thinking about just now. So, um, you know there is a patent uh, for everything and you can patent pretty much everything. And we have a, a, an example. I think Stephen disagrees. <laughs> yeah, so, so well, we'll, come, we'll come things, back to Stephen. Just to put things in perspective, um, I like to talk about, uh, you know, the IP to, for a uh, tool to entertain a cat. Um, so, and it, it exists, and it, it, it's, a, it is granted. <laughs> it's, a, it's a patent to, for, you know, making um, lights to, to make a, a, a cat jump. Um, so, anyway, that was a, a little parenthesis. But at Helix, <laughs> we're serious. You don't do that at Helix? <laughs> no, we spend our lives doing that. Um, no, so that's just the beginning, and we have to add the value. So. Um, so the, the, the novelty um, at Helix in particular, it's a new drug disease or disease drug relationship. Now we have to provide uh, supporting evidence, data, in vitro data, in vivo data, and then we have to start clinical trial. And the more um, advanced we go in the d drug development um, route, and the more the value, uh, the bigger the value of, of the asset. So the patent is really the, the very start. Okay, so now, now we generate the patent, we kind of know a bit <coughs> how we're going to assess the value of the release, generate a bit more, and we come to Cambridge Enterprise. So what does it mean to commercialize it from? Obviously, you've been helping us from the beginning, let's say at least. Yeah, so we don't, we don't start at the patent. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> people come to us wanting to start at the patent. We don't start at the patent. <laughs> um, people come to us and say, will you patent this? And we 
don't go there. We go back to, to that value proposition. Um, so, so you know, this firstly is can we see a value in this? Can we see a value? Can we see a route forward potentially to a market? And uh, with, that, with a relatively low amount of diligence, we will be happy to file a patent application to get started, to get some protection, to allow us to start talking to industry. And so the first thing you know, is getting out there, really understanding what the need for, for this, this is. After that, there's just a huge range of different things that we do. And I'm not sure you're going to give me the time. <laughs> I think, really I, think I'm, I, I wanted to give you the time. <laughs> um, but, ju but just, because, just before because, you start on that, I think, I think it's also important for everyone kind of to know what is it kind of do when we come to Cambridge Enterprise, how much does Cambridge University already have or own about our, our own property, let's say from our research? If we're a researcher here. Um, okay, so uh, university intellectual property policy, um, many pages. Uh, simply, um, registered rights, so patents essentially, are for staff, are owned in the first instance by the university. Um, for students, students essentially own their own intellectual property unless they're working very closely in with, with some researchers. Non registered intellectual property rights the university does not make a claim to. Um, but one of the, actually one of the great things about the, the University of Cambridge intellectual property policy is the opt-in, opt-out. So the, the, um, the university makes initial claim to, to patents, to registered intellectual property rights. But assuming there's no external contracts that prevent this, it is the inventor's choice whether they actually want to work with Cambridge Enterprise or not. Um, I think that's a really fabulous part of our, our IP policy because it keeps us on our toes. Um, cause it's also very different from what the universities It's very different from many other universities, well. yeah. But it, it keeps us on our toes. We've got to provide a service, otherwise people don't work with us. Um, and for people who really know what they're going to do, they can go off and do it and we don't get in the way. Yeah. So, um, well, th thanks for that, but now we can come back <laughs> to... Um, I will give you the time yeah. to speak I mean, more about okay. it. What do we do to develop a proposition? Well, I mean, it's, there's such a range of different things. There's a lot of different things we do. Um, and so let's start. Um, I mean, people are really important. Um, if there isn't a person in that group who is in some way interested in taking this forward commercially, um, either to work with an existing company or with a new company, uh, we can't do anything. So, um, so normally the, 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 the PI is pretty busy. Um, so a postdoc or a student is often the key person. So one of the things we often do is actually developing that person, um, helping them. You know, there's various courses around the university to, to help people do that, getting people onto those courses, but also helping to support them to develop themselves. So that's a key part. Um, then there's a question of getting some money in to do the next stage of development. Um, so. You know, maybe it can still be funded by research money, um, but there's quite a lot of different forms of translational research, um, tra translational research money from various sources, um, which we will help people to try to get. Um, some of those from the research councils, some from charities, depending on the, the sector you're in. So there's quite a lot of work done in, in getting some funding in to do the translational research. So they're not the basic research anymore, but the work that is going between what is basic research and moving towards a commercial goal. Um, so you know, we're trying to get this to a point where, where someone will, will license the intellectual property, basically, um, either a new company with an investor or an existing company. So developing the people, um, you know, doing translational funding for whatever purpose, building prototypes, looking at markets, um, a whole range of things there that you can do. Um, and then looking for the money, looking for the next set of money, the real investment to take the technology forward. Okay. So that's in the in brief is what we do. Having, <laughs> also having, having you know, worked with Cambridge Enterprise a lot, you know, they also just will help a lot, I think. I mean, my, so the, the, the guy who, um, who, who, who was my main contact at Cambridge Enterprise at the start, um, you know, he, he, um, he sat on uh, our board. Um, our board was literally just me and him. He came to London, uh, we had a chat, but it was a very useful chat. It was really good. It helped us really get our house in order. And without that, you know, we just wouldn't have known what to do at all. Um, that might not be every time, but it was very useful for us. And also they'll just kind of get on the phone. You know, the, the number of times I called people at Cambridge Enterprise and just like asked advice, um, you know, in the middle of the, not quite in the middle of the night, but you know. Um, 
uh, and yeah, and a lot of this is that sort of stuff. Yeah, just, you know, it's, 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 it's really you know, which which lots yeah. of investors do, but you know, I, I would say that Cambridge Enterprise are kind of very good at that, and they are very good. I think because of the university connection and because they understand where this stuff has come from, they they they, they take a different attitude to it. You know, we also had a bunch of investors who who were kind of more, um, you know, from a kind of London kind of more commercial, um, more, more like. Um, you know, more like the mobile phone apps you were, you were discussing. And, um, and and that's really useful as well, um, but, but for a different set of things. And I think Cambridge Enterprise, like, let, just have, a, have this take that is actually quite rare um, among investors in general. Um, so, yeah, I think it's worth very much. One of the things I'm doing is sort of stopping at the point where we're actually going for the venture investment, because I don't want to stop people coming next week when they're ah, really sorry. talking. Next week, Andrew Bay from our... <laughs> he's, he's going to be talking about the actual venture investment right. a lot more. Yeah. So, um, so I'm deliberately stopping at that point. So she's got something still to say next week. Well, that's fine. We'll just, we can, we can, we can <laughs> discuss. But you can, you can, you can, you can carry on. <laughs> no, you, you can still discuss. You can, right, you, you, you. They do that too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, good. Um, okay. Well, going on towards you, if I, if IP is the pillars, what is then the team? Ed. Um, well, can we can we start? With, I mean. Can we start at the very early team? Yeah, yeah. Um, of course. That's because, uh, and I think those who heard Jason last week um, when he was talking about teams, one of the things he said is the team is an awful lot broader than you think it is. Um, you know, it's not just you and your co-founder and other couple of people who you employ. It's everybody else. It includes your your partner. Um, it includes, you know, obviously your patent attorneys. It includes a vast number of people um, who get involved. All these successful enterprises, even though you know you might have been one. I bet there was an awful lot of people. There were so many people on my deck. So many people. Oh, hundreds, and they were they were really advising me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Huge Definitely. numbers of people getting. Yeah, no, Cambridge Enterprise never would have invested invested in me if I hadn't been chatting to a lot of other people. Yeah. So that you know, we we talked about the core team. I said you've got to have somebody who's really willing to take that science forward. But outside that, there's just there's a huge, a team huge numbers of people that you go to for advice on on different things, and that's part of what we do is point to people to other people who know more about things than we do. To give more advice. Give more advice, yeah, and that's it's a key thing. With any commercialisation mm. is, is, is it's you know it's a contact sport. It's about talking to people. Um, you've got to talk to lots of people. So no. I can comment on this and, and share the the, the experience of um, Helix. So Helix was founded by uh, Tim Gillian um, shortly after he finished his PhD, um, and obviously very young. He had the brilliant idea to uh, pair up. Um, and to co-found Helix uh, with someone with much more experience, um, uh, Dave Brown, who is um, co-inventor of um, on a Viagra patent. Uh, so there was a, a combination between a very young uh, and ambitious uh, person, team, and a very experienced, gray hair um, um, a man, and that was really good. And that's one of the, the strengths uh, of, of team and uh, Team, uh, Team Gilliams and, and why Helix um, you know, grew so fast and so well is because at each time, at the very um, early stages or even now, um, he was able to um, you know, acknowledge his own weaknesses and the weaknesses of you know, the organization and go and get the best person possible um, to complement the team. So that's a skill. To know your weaknesses, not just your know stress. your weaknesses, and to convince others um, to join. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. I, I, the only thing I'll add to that is uh, one of the wonders of the what they call the Cambridge ecosystem is that there are so many brilliant people around Cambridge who will talk to you about these things, who are quite happy to be relatively free with their time and their advice uh, when you're at the early stages to help you uh, mm -hmm. through those through those phases. Um, it, is, it is one of the good things about Cambridge as a place, and it's one of the reasons people attribute to the success and the growth now of startups and um, scale-ups and beyond that in Cambridge. Yep. Uh, now I want to open it up to the audience to give you a bit more time uh, for the questions. So are there any questions for our vlogging panel? Yes, there, please. Hello, a quick question for Ed. So uh, last year it was 
uh, in uh, AI presentation of NVIDIA, uh, they had a, a very nice video, and at the end they, they had that uh, the music was, pro was made by an AI algorithm. And the name of the company was not uh, by dance or the one that uh, you, uh, you mentioned. My question is how your IP protection uh, can leave other companies create probably the same result. So could you please comment? I think that's a really good question, actually. Um, yeah, I mean, since we started the company back in 2010, lots of other companies have sprung up from you know, big ones like Google and Microsoft who are doing this as well to, to ones that were more our size um, and smaller. Um, and that, that does, I think, touch on an important thing. I mean, look, I, I think in our field, we were, you know, there were elements of, you know, deep science and I, I guess, you know, there was machine learning, but, we, you know, we were, we were very unlike Helix, for instance, you know, and we were never going to have a billion dollar patent. Um, patents for us, as I say, didn't quite serve that purpose. They served other purposes. Um, I do think it's something, actually, it's something I'd love to get Stephen's opinion on. Because one thing we were warned by the patent attorneys we chatted to, and I will just chat about patents here, is that you do have to, in, in, in more that end of, of products, you have, do have to be a bit careful um, because obviously what, what filing a patent does is it makes how you're doing it public. Um, uh, not immediately, I can't remember how long it is, is it 18 months? 18 months. 18 months down the line, so it makes it public. So you really have to make that call. Now if you're, you know, if you're a very, very deep science, you know, biotech company, maybe you want to do that because this, this is going to be worth huge amounts of money. But if you're a consumer electronics company, and, and, and most companies will be somewhere in the middle, probably, um, you do have to think about that. And it's really on a case-by-case -case basis. And there were things we, we actively chose not to patent because you know, we'd, we, had, we, we had something innovative. We had a technical effect. We probably could have patented it. But we, we, we didn't otherwise have to expose how we were doing that. And so we decided not to. I did, I, I did ultimately see um, you know, other companies patent, patent things that maybe we could have patented previously. Um, Ultimately, I think that that didn't really matter for a company like ours because it wasn't, you know, uh, it, it wasn't entirely built on on patents. I think it matters more for a really deep science company. Um, so yeah, I would say that ultimately you've got to bear in mind that, especially towards uh, towards that end of the the consumer electronics spectrum, you're always going to have competition, and you're always going to, you know, ultimately if you don't have competition, you're doing something very wrong because um, it basically means what you're doing is worthless. Um, so I, the, the the day that the fir the first major company to actually do what we started doing. Um, was Google. Um, they started about five years after us. And the day they announced they, they were doing this, I took a long walk with my co-founders. This is why you need co-founders. I took a long walk with my co-founder. And we were think, just thinking, oh, I mean, what are we going to do? Google, are, I think they were the biggest company in the world at the time. Ultimately, we chatted to Cambridge Enterprise, among other people. And you know, we, we ultimately realized that, like, you know, com firstly, competition shows you're doing something right. Secondly, ultimately, you know, this is, if it's a big tech company doing that kind of thing, ultimately they're, they're probably going to move slower than you. They can't be quite as innovative. They can't move quite as fast. Are they really going to monetize this? There are a bunch of reasons why you, know, you shouldn't worry about competition. You should see it as a good thing. Um, so yeah, but I would, to go right back there, I, I would maybe take that to Stephen. I'd love to get maybe Stephen's take on a potential danger of filing patents, um, you know, just sort of all over the place. Yeah, and so going back to the original question, um, Ed's patents or um, uh, your, your company's patents will protect a particular way of making music. Now, it's quite possible that so there are other AI algorithms out there that can make the music in a different way. Um, so it is quite important that, that patents are never going to completely block competition. They're going to block people from copying you doing your business, the, sorry, other people from doing business the way you are doing your business. Um, and it's one of the things that is said to sort of drive the innovation is people trying to work around it, find out different ways when they can do the same thing. They might be better ways, they might be inferior ways. If you can manage to block off the better ways, you've done well because <laughs> everyone else is left to catch up. But quite often there will be comparable ways um, that you can achieve the same thing. To pick up Ed's point about sort of do you, essentially, do you file a patent application or not? And it is, it's one of those early considerations that I was talking about that sort of you have to think about what, what are the pros and cons of, of, of the different routes? Do you want to tell everyone how to do it? Probably because they're going to find out anyway if you, if, if you don't. So telling them, well, okay, they might find out a bit earlier, but you do have the chance of getting that monopoly right to protect it. Or do you have something, perhaps in the Helix sense, that actually no one's ever going to work out exactly what the Helix AI is doing 
inside inside the the, the, co the company, um, and therefore it's not worth ri the risk of exposing it to tell everyone how to do it when you can just keep doing it yourself. Um, so it, it is an important consideration, and it's why I'd say talk to someone about it at the early stage because they can they can look at what you're doing at your industry and say, is this something that you want to do um, in terms of going down the route of applying for patents, which will result in publication? Or do you have, is it safe to try and keep it secret? Um, particularly in the computer space and the coding space, um, the chances are if, you, if you've got technology and people can see what the results, what your outputs are and what your inputs are, they're going to work out what's, what's going on in the middle. If they don't do it exactly the same way, they'll do it a slightly different way. Um, but in, in the end, if you can protect it, you probably might as well. Um, in, in, the other, in, in the case of things that are much harder to discover, um, particular ways of doing things, particular ways of making products that you might have optimised, um, that can be something that's more beneficial to keep secret and protect the know-how behind it. Now, do you want to add something? Because we all know that Tesla, for instance, loves tra trade secrets and doesn't use that many patents, for instance. Mm. Well, at yeah. least that's how they started out at the beginning, because they did want the first mover advantage, but not giving any kind of information mm. out there, keeping it tight. Yeah, and, and it, also, it will also depend on the time scale. As Ed says, when you file a patent application, the information in that application publishes after 18 months. If 18 months is enough for you to be up and running, then that's great. Otherwise, you might be, want, might be thinking, well, is this something I can hold off on filing the patent application until perhaps we've got more information, until we're sure of our commercial route, um, be, be, before you do it. So that's another decision that goes into the mix. Yeah, so I mean, I can, I can also, um, the experience at Helix is that, and coming from me personally, coming from the experience of being at Cambridge Amplified, where patent is a religion, um, <laughs> you know, in, in a place at Helix where, you know, there's actually no point in, in, in filing a patent. Um, it's, it's a bit strange, but again and again, very regularly, we uh, evaluate the need for, for patents and you know, IP protection. And we're working with patent attorneys who are you know, uh, checking all the time. And you know, there's, 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 really, there's really no point because the value is, is elsewhere, is in the know-how and, and what, what the AI is producing. So, so far, can I just comment on the religion? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you know what I, mean. I know what you mean. But, it, but there is a point to make here um, that in the university, um, we don't really have trade secrets. You know, universities publish stuff. Um, so the nice thing about patents is they're compatible with the, with the academic life. Um, that, that a patent gets published, but you can, you, know, you, can, you can publish your papers at the same time. So we do often end up patenting things that Possibly, if we were a commercial organisation, we would not patent. We would keep as a trade secret, but we can't because we don't we keep trade secrets because you need to publish. Yeah. Um, so it's <laughs> actually maybe just to build on that as well. One, one thing we, we we did at Duke Deck, um, yeah, was exactly that. You know, we we would sometimes we would sometimes patent in order to publish something. And, and the big reason for us, but we weren't in academia. But the big reason for us to publish things was to have yeah, have right. things at conferences and get kind of exposure and, and, and basically for hiring more than anything else. Um, and also that can attract researchers because researchers kind of want to, you know, continue publishing. So if you're a company that can do that, but you do often need to consider patenting first just so you have some protection for this thing that you're otherwise putting out in the open. So that, that's another thing to bear in mind. Okay, thanks. Um, any other questions? As, as, as a designation, um, I'm, I'm not convinced about it. Service mark or trademarks for services have been around uh, for, for less time than you might think. Um, so certainly when I entered the profession, they were a relatively new thing that you could get trademarks uh, for, for services. But um, certainly as, as businesses move much more towards a service-based 
approach. We're seeing everything AAS um, now, whatever it is, whether it's software, whether it's data, whether it's something else. Um, but I don't. Um, I mean, that has been covered for at least for 25 or more years by the general trademark system. If you want to call it a service mark rather than a trademark, well, that's entirely up to you and your, your preference. I don't. I haven't seen that catching on um, this side of the pond in, in that respect. Um, but it, it is important to remember that sort of uh, uh, what people are designating as, as, as their brand, they're sort of they're claiming some ownership in it. And so that service mark designation is obviously their way of doing it um, in those cases. If, um, if you have a registered trademark, um, the, the much stronger sort of uh, stay off my patch type indication is the R in the circle. Um, you're only allowed by law to use that if you have a registered trademark. Um, and that's a much stronger indication than the TM or the SM as you're talking about. Thanks. Thank, thanks, Tim. Uh, next question, so up there. Yep. Hi. Could you give some examples of how you could commercialize your products? Commercializing it. What are those sort of types of ways of commercializing? Different types of commercializing. We'll be going to um, uh, Malcolm. To Malcolm. Um. Right. Can you just explain a little bit more what what you mean in terms? Well, you've got the idea. You're going to have. There are different ways of commercialising it. Right. You can sell it, license it, patent licensing it. Yeah. Okay. So I mean, you know, fundamentally, um, what we're doing is licensing, but but in another fundamental way, you can either form a collaboration with a uh, with an existing company, or you can create a company, and you know, fundamentally, those are the two ways you can go about doing this. Um, that's the basic answer. Probably not as much of an answer as you want. Um, well, you've lost the microphone now, so you can't say more. <laughs> <laughs> you can bring it back if you want to give a longer answer. Now on. Well, no, there was product, selling a product, licensing a product, licensing a service. And the other one that hasn't been come up here is, is Licensing patents, because patents themselves are, licensing patents themselves are slightly okay. different to maybe licensing yeah, a product. Okay, so what, in Cambridge Enterprise we do a lot of licensing patents, but that's licensing patents not as a, as a goal in, its, in itself, but as a means towards the end of getting university technology out into the world. So fundamentally that's what we're trying to do, is get university technology out into the world. So we license patents um, so that someone will invest in the university technology. So it's not a, you know, it's not a, it's not a, a it's a route towards commercialization, I would say, rather than commercializing itself. So we, that is, we, we, we obviously are protecting the university's IP and we are licensing that IP to different companies in different ways. But, you know, fundamentally that's what the university does. Um, and then after, th after that, a product or service is developed by that licensing partner. Is that heavily what Cambridge Enterprise would do, though? That's what we do, yes. Right. That's I mean, in terms of in, in terms of sort of the broader world beyond beyond Cambridge Enterprise, you, you're absolutely right. You can have a business model which is I'm going to invent things and I'm going to license other people to use them, um, or, or I'm going to license my my IP um, in that sense, or even I'm just going to sell it. Um, sort of uh, once I've got good IP, I'm going to try to go to Google or Amazon and and sell it to them, that, so they can take it on and develop it. The, the difficulty, if that doesn't come with a with a business proposition, is that um, there is the question of, and then what? Um, or if if it's turned down, well, what are you going to do with that? If what are you going to do about the investment you've made in it? Um, if if that's your only a, um, exit at the end of the of the day. Um, there's something I should say. There's, there's there's different parts of Cambridge Enterprise. So there's a part I'm involved in, which is largely about developing the intellectual property to the point at which it is commercially valuable. Um, and then there's our seed funds team, the investment team, who, who invest in, in, in new companies. So it sort of flows through often from, from my team through to the investment team. And if you want to hear more about them, come next week. Good segue. <laughs> Thank you. Hi, I'm Rebecca. I'm CEO of a young deep tech startup. And I've only been in post six months, and part of my remit um, is developing an IP strategy for our young company. 
Um, we got a few million in seed funding last year and we're just thinking about our next funding round. And I work in a space where people patent a lot and there's a lot of litigation in our space as well. And I have a clever team of postdocs and we could patent one thing a month if we wanted to. But I'm also in charge of finance. And talking about the wider <laughs> team, I've never spent as much time with lawyers in my life in this role. And I'm learning a lot and I'm enjoying it. But we're at that challenging impasse. And I suspect this is a question that you can't perfectly answer, Stephen. But how much money should you spend on this? Because <laughs> I, ca I can't, we can't afford to patent every, something every month you know, until we get more cash. But we do need to protect our assets at the same time. So we're just trying that. We're in that kind of sticky phase about you know, how much of our budget should I assign for this? We're taking it super seriously and having lots of conversations. And I know you can't answer it perfectly, but it'd be just great to get your take and that of the panel on, on the situation, which I suspect yeah. a lot of people in this room are possibly in. Yeah, I, I, I completely understand. And it is a, a big dichotomy at the startup scale up. Um, sort of how much is this going to cost us? Um, because cash is short normally at that point. Um, and sort of essentially it comes back to the question of, well, how much is it worth to you? Um, and there are, there are ways in which you can, uh, certainly if you're talking about sort of generating enough ideas to be filing one or more applications a month, um, that there are ways in which you might be able to consolidate your, your spend on that. Um, but, but ultimately the, the question becomes sort of, well, how much money have you got? Um, and what proportion of that are you assigning the value to the, to the IP that you're generating because in the future that is going to be the value of the company? Um, or, and either from a, from a sort of establishing you and getting sort of investors into you, but also from, from it sounds like your space, sort of almost protectively that you have IP so that not everyone's going to jump on top of you um, because, because you're, you're the smallest person there. Um, in, in, in terms of sort of trying to rationalise your spend, um, one thing you can look at is how much can you consolidate into um, single applications. Um, although, and it's getting a little bit into the details, the patent system says you should only have one invention per application. Um, that doesn't stop you filing an application that has a lot of inventions in it um, and dealing with the problems down the road when you have more money to deal with it. Um, that's probably about as far as I can go. I, I, I can't pluck numbers out of the air and say sort of it should be 25%, it should be 10%. Um, it really does depend on, on value, what you have the money for, what, where, where your other money is going, um, and, and whether you need that money for something else. And coming back to a much smaller scale, something we always say to people who w walk in the door with new ideas is, this is going to cost you money. What are you going to do to get that money back? We're, we're, why is that going to create value for you to go down the patent route? Um, and if, if, if they say, well, actually, I don't know, then probably they shouldn't be filing patent applications. If they do know and they can say, well, actually, I can see this opportunity here, I can see that this is going to protect a market that's worth this much, then that investment becomes easier to rationalise. And that's the balance that, as a, on your financial hat on, that's the balance you've got to make in terms of what you spend and the value it creates. So I I can echo that a little bit and um, I can really um, identify myself in what you're um, saying because at Helix, uh, so we have, um, our CEO gave us this crazy mission uh, to have a hundred grand in this treatment uh, by 2025, uh, hundred, sorry, hundred grand in this treatment underway. <laughs> 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 anywhere between, you know, discovery to clinical trials. So we also have, for each opportunity, not only one patent, but several patents protecting an asset. So we can't, we, we have to have a ruthless prioritization. And I would say, to echo what you're saying, it's a really good position to be in and a really good pressure to, um, to select only those opportunities who have a clear commercial path and a clear return. And that you have thought through every step of the way from patent protection to uh, revenue generation. Mm -hmm. I think there's one other thing that might be worth thinking about is what your exit strategy is. Um, and you know how much, you know, given that a lot of the patent spend is a few years down the road. Um, and yeah. Four I years, we think four years as an exit maybe. <laughs> 
Yeah, yeah, okay. <laughs> you can spend a lot of money in four years. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, um, but it is an important thing, isn't it? Who are you exiting to? What's their, what, their, what are they going to be interested in in terms of your patent portfolio? Um, and you know, a lot of that spend could come later. You can, you know, you're not in a position like us of having to patent before someone publishes. You can, you can hold that back and, and file your patents a bit later, possibly. Um, just some thoughts. Ed, do you want to add that? I mean, yeah, my, I guess my two cents are that probably the most useful thing we did in our whole kind of patenting journey, and you've probably done this already, but um, is we had, a, we had a couple of brainstorming sessions with a patent attorney, um, one just with me and my co-founder, but then actually with, with a bunch of key researchers as well, um, going through and prioritizing with the patent attorney uh, in the room and, and talking them through all the ideas, and, um, and then actually got, got that attorney to come in and um, chat with our board as well and kind of present her findings and things. Um, and so we had then another discussion at board level. And then, because then you get into these questions of things like exit and prioritization. So you have the prioritization from the research side and then from the board side as well. And found that an incredibly useful process in terms of, um, you're probably already doing it, but in terms of prioritization. Okay, thanks. I think there was another question there, yeah. Thank you very much. It was a very interesting discussion. The question I have is what do you do if you're working across contexts? So do the laws of IP is it internationally agreed upon, or does it vary from context to context? And what do you do when you are kind of in the sphere of working with people from different contexts or from different countries? How does that work? Broadly, IP laws are, I'll, I'll go as far as to say they're similar across different continents and different countries. There are, there are nuances, there are, there are variations. Um, but, but largely speaking, certainly on, on the path in, in respect of patents, uh, international patent law is relatively similar around the world, uh, barring sort of some, some quirks at the side and some systems. Um, so normally, uh, as well, the, the systems are set up so that you don't have to go, if you like, big bang and say, I want to protect in all these different countries so that I get worldwide protection. You can start from a single application and you have time in which you can uh, choose the countries that you actually want to protect, um, which is helpful in terms of the cash flow and, and the sort of the development of that. In terms of working with people from different countries, uh, that is that sort of that's something to be aware of. Is that different countries do have uh, requirements about filing applications in different countries if the innovation was either created by their nationals or created by their residents. Um, but that's a problem that sort of it's very hard to be specific about until you start talking about someone from a particular country or someone working in a particular country. Um, and I'll just use your question as an opportunity to say one of the things that actually I was talking about sort of thinking about IP at the early stage, ownership is a really important thing to have considered, to have tied down and documented at the early stage to make sure that it does actually reside in the company or whatever vehicle you're using for the commercialization. Um, and that the people that you've engaged with and have contributed um, are not going to walk off and, and use that um, IP in, on their own right or um, sell it to someone else even. Stephen, can I ask you a question? Yeah. Um, so just very related to that. I mean, so you do the initial application, then you do the PCT application, the international application. Then at the end of that process, you have to decide, okay, which countries do we actually want this to, you know, ultimately hopefully be granted yeah. in? Um, I always found that decision incredibly hard because um, all of them is the answer, <laughs> but it costs incredible amounts of money. How, how do you think about that, about kind of um, advising which countries to, to ultimately fight? You don't have to do it initially, obviously, but down no. the line a few years in. No, I, and, and I'm sure Malcolm encounters this all the time in terms of, of, of prioritizing, but he's probably tried to license it off before it gets to that. Well, stage. yeah, I mean, it's such an important decision yeah. that I would mm. like my licensee to yeah. be involved. And yeah. it's mm. such a difficult decision. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I mean, the, 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 the best way I've found of describing it is it's a bit like a, a Swiss cheese. You're going to end up with holes. Um, and what you've got to decide is where it's important that the cheese is um, and uh, where you don't mind them to be holes. Um, and it is very budget driven because sort of essentially each country or each region you add multiplies the cost um, at, at, at the order of, of magnitude scale. Yeah. Um, so you're looking at you're looking at markets. Um, you're looking at where is this going to be successful? Um, where is this product actually or this service actually going to be delivered? Um, you're looking at manufacturing if it's a if it's a tangible product, um, and 
uh, then you're looking at value of those, of those countries. What you try to do, if you've got the resources, is you try to essentially make it uh, un, unfinancially viable, or financially unviable, uh, for a competitor to come along and take the bits that you haven't got. Mm -hmm. um, so if you can block someone out of the market in the States, Europe, China, you've already got a good chunk of the, of, of the world's population covered, certainly in terms of disposable income um, on, on a product. And is it really then going to be worth someone doing exactly the same thing in what's remaining? Uh, this, this does vary massively. If you're a pharmaceutical company, then probably, and you think this is going to be your, your blockbuster drug, then yes, you do actually yeah. protect it in 120 different countries. Mm -hmm. um, but if you're, uh, I mean, a lot of, a lot of um, engineering and electronics companies will go fairly narrow. They yeah. will just protect uh, the US, Germany, UK, France, Netherlands, Japan, China, um, and, and they'll leave it at that. Because mm -hmm. actually, on the scale that they're talking about, someone developing a new product just for the remaining market isn't worth it. Thanks. Okay. Thank you. Uh, yeah, next question. Uh, hi there. I just wanted to ask, uh, especially given the, the panel is uh, sort of AI focused, let's say, um, uh, how does ownership work in the case of uh, IP generated by AI? And so especially <laughs> if you provided data by different sources, it might be a, yeah. Broad question, but just want uh, to hear your comments. Yeah. Do you study at the University of Sussex? <laughs> <laughs> uh, because uh, th so th so they are th they are trying to push the boundaries in terms of um, you might have heard of Dabus, uh, their their AI um, inventor. Um, generally, uh, the principle around most of the world is that at the moment uh, the legal systems are set up so that there has to be a human involved in in the inventorship process. Uh, in terms of an AI um, system that, that might have come up with the answer that is the invention, uh, that's normally ascribed to either the person who trained the AI system, who, who set up the information of it, or who gave the direction or the pointer that sort of pushed the AI system in that, in that direction. Um, but it's, it's a developing area of law and something that perhaps we are going to have to deal with in the future. Um, it doesn't seem to be that. It's sort of it's at the edges at the moment. Um, it's sort of it's one for the law for the law students mm -hmm. rather than for the practitioners at the moment. So y yeah, um, so we have thought of about that a lot, and we have had loads of conversations about that um, with our patent attorneys. And um, at Helix, for example, we have a stage that AI and AI is lasts a certain amount of time. There is an output. And um, the pharmacologists, so it's the, the, the humans, are going to take this output and establish a pharmacological rational. And the pharmacological rational is the novelty, the invention. So <coughs> in our case, we have sort of went through the whole process and are very confident that the inventor, and very comfortable saying the inventor is that person. No one here probably cares about music, but I'm going to tell you about music anyway, because it is really interesting, and, and it's, it's kind of, un, it's, it's unsolved. There's, we thought about this loads at Duke Deck as well, because you know, we had an AI system that was writing music. Who owns that music? No idea. Um, very hard to tell. There, there, there are some interesting kind of theories about kind of, yeah, is it the user of the end, yeah, the end user of the system who's actually kind of using your tool? Because um, if you think about music, and if, you use an, if I use an AI system, this is our, our website, you could just say, I want a jazz track that's one and a half minutes long, and that you know, peaks at... 52 seconds, and that's sad. And then, you know, <laughs> and, and we write you that piece of music. Hopefully, it's quite sad. Hopefully, it's jazzy. You know, and it peaks at that point, and it, you know, it kind of works for you. Um, but, but, but ultimately, like how? Because if you if you think about kind of a digital, I don't know if anyone's a musician, a digital audio workstation where you might make music as a producer, like you, you ultimately own the copyright and the music you use there. But there, you're basically using technology. Yes, you're you're directing it more, like a lot more. Um, uh, you know, you're saying, okay, I want this note to happen here and that note to happen here. And, you know, but, but maybe you'll use some samples, maybe you'll use some loops. You know, you're not actually writing everything in there, but you still kind of own the copyright at the end. Um, there's a really interesting question there. My understanding is it's not really solved. 
um, Stephen might know more. I, uh, is there not a famous kind of monkey selfie uh, example yeah. where the monkey took the photo of itself? And I think the conclusion of that, but someone can correct me, was that, um, was that copyright did not exist in this photo because it was a monkey and not a person that took the photo. Does yeah. anyone think that's wrong? I think that's right. That's, yeah, OK. Yeah. So, so that, that is fun. I don't know if it's relevant. <laughs> <laughs> so what is currently in music, then? What is, what is the, the actual yeah, case in music? In, in your, yeah. um, I have uh, sort of no comment in that. I basically don't know. I'm not a lawyer. Um, I've chatted to lawyers a lot about this in my time at Duke Deck, and the general answer I got was, yeah, we'll see. Basically, okay. um, <laughs> copyright law, it basically hasn't really been tested in the courts yet. So, you know, at some point it'll be tested and someone will make a decision. I mean, you know, the, the EU copyright directive's coming in and that'll probably be relevant at least until we leave the EU. And then what will we do? Absolutely no idea. Um, so, yeah, I wash my hands of the whole thing. True. Well, I suppose I no longer have a product, so it's made easier for me. Um, but uh, when we did it, what, I mean, what we did is we, we just kind of had in our terms and conditions um, that, uh, you know, you use this tool. And I think, I think we gave you, what we gave you was kind of an indefinite license, a perpetual license on all platforms to use this stuff. But, you know, does that really work? I, I don't know. I mean, uh, you know, co copyright is, you know, it, it, it exists in and of itself, doesn't it? Yeah. So. You know, we, 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 we took the advice of kind of lawyers and stuff, and that's what we put. It could be tested down the line. It's very hard to tell. I think ultimately in, in sort of the next 10 years, there'll be some big case, and, and it will be decided. And it will be very interesting. Lawyers will have a field day. Um, and I will be very interested to read the results. But I, I, yeah, I, I don't know what the answer is. Yeah, I mean, copyright music's difficult anyway because there's yeah. a limited number of notes and harmonies and sequences that you can do. And that's yeah. why you've got all the, um, the US... Um, uh, music writers suing each other yes. for, for taking bits of their songs and only a musicologist can actually pick out the, sort of the sequence of notes that is repeated. Yeah, um, yeah so it's, it, it's difficult because there is a limit to what you can do with music. It's, it, I mean, it's, it's a bit like the, sort of the monkeys producing Shakespeare if you put enough of them in front of typewriters. That's certainly how I think about music. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, quick question. So you often hear these days that data is the new oil and that there's many sort of um, ventures whose entire uh, commercial value add is access to some proprietary data set. Uh, do IP, do legal protections exist for such uh, data assets? Or is it a case of just bolt down the hatches and never lose them? Uh, so it, it falls into the realms of copyright, um, and in, the, in, in Europe, certainly, there is a, another right called database right, which is about creating and storing and uh, maintaining databases or stores of data, um, which, have a, which have relationships. Um, but it, it is a really good point, because sort of what, what is protected tends to be the creation of this, um, the sort of the assimilation of data, uh, which is what most sort of valuable data stores are. It's the sort of, it's the Google tracking where you've been for the last two years. Um, that, that's the valuable data. That is, that is much harder to protect, and it's also one of the areas where the laws are completely different around the world as to what's protected and how it's protected. You probably know more because you're yeah, dealing so with... We, we sort of feel about this a lot as well, um, especially in the early days of Helix. Um, so we have data, proprietary data, um, the data that we have, um, you know, processed in a way, and we thought, where is our value? Is it in uh, tech? Is it in IP? Is it in the data? And really, the short answer is um, the data is only valuable because of what you're going to do with it and how you're going to commercialize it. And you can have so much crap data, that, and it's so difficult to, to put a number on, on, you know, on, on data, and you know, it's so subjective as well um, that I, I wouldn't put a lot of faith in how it's going to evolve, but it's really personal. I think it's better to have tangible, um, you know, reliable, um, sort of good old IP. Okay, thanks. Any further questions? 
Yeah. Yeah. Turn on the mic. Yeah. Hi. Um, thanks for, for your answers. Um, I was wondering about the IP, um, who owns the IP in terms of students and postdocs. So, for example, if uh, one is now uh, a member of staff but invented something uh, during their PhD years, can they claim, and they can prove that, can they claim that the university does not automatically own the IP of that invention because it was done by a PhD student? Or does the fact that now they are a member of staff uh, outweighs the fact that they discovered it as a, as a student? Malcolm, I think you're Thank you. um, the best one to answer this. Yeah, um, uh, this feels like an individual case. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I don't like to make general pronouncements on something there's probably an individual case that needs to be talked about um frankly i would if this is you or maybe your friend um, maybe they should come and Ask chat to us about it <laughs> um yeah i think it just come and talk we we'll talk it through in terms of the real details of, of, of the case university ip is incredibly complicated um, we spend a lot of time sorting it out um, it's a part of the job that i didn't talk about but it, no, is important. You know, an important part of what we do is we, is we clean up the IP to make it investable. Um, universities are very messy places from IP points of view and we sort of spend a lot of our time just cleaning that. So we're very happy to talk to the person involved but I'm not going to make a general pronouncement in a, in a recorded um, um, <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I'm happy to chip in, I, I, but I'll do it in general terms rather than in terms of Cambridge Enterprise, which is that uh, if you invent something, uh, you are the first owner of that invention. Uh, what happens with it after that depends on the circumstances in which it was invented, uh, particularly whether you were employed by someone um, or whether you were under some contract or you were doing work under some contract, for example, with a research council that says that they are funding you uh, but they will own what comes out of that, of, of that research. Um, so basic position, you're the first owner, but that is in 90 odd percent of cases is overridden by some other consideration. Thanks. Any last questions? Hi, this is probably for Michelle and, um, and Stephen, I think. Um, with your uh, AI inventions, at what level of maturity do you pull the trigger on actually patenting it? Um, and then Stephen, uh, you mentioned about um, fix it down the line as a concept. We have a very early stage medical device, which we are already sort of filing patents for, because we received advice that as we work on it and new uh, patentable topics come up, we can keep revising it or we can keep playing with it. So what are some strategies and ways and what's a reasonable approach to fix it down the line? So what level of maturity and how do you fix it down the line? So um, medical device is very difficult for our space drug. Um, in our case, and maybe, maybe broader, as soon as you have very strong data to prove, um, to prove your invention, um, and it can be, uh, for drugs, it can be that you have very strong, very strong in vitro data or in vivo data or, or in vivo data. More likely in vivo data. That's, I would say. Yeah, I, I certainly, sort of, it, as I said before, it is, it is a decision point. It's sort of you have to decide at what point do I start the clock running? Um, because the patent system works to deadlines, and if you file an application, by a certain point in the future, you have to do other things. Um, in terms of fixing it down the line, um, within the first year after you file something, there is the option to refile, to add more information. Um, on the proviso that, when, that anything you file at any other point only gets dated when you file it. You can't take, go back to the original date with something new that you've added. Um, so you do have to balance that with the anything that's being published, anything that you're releasing because you're releasing prototypes or you're um, putting something up on a website. Um, uh, there, are, there are options if you don't think you're completely ready to sort of effectively abandon and restart the clock running, um, provided again that nothing has been published and gone out there. What I was talking about earlier was more the sort of the, that you can combine things together 
um, in a single application to get it filed, to, to get a date for that, for that material. And then in the future, you can decide which of the actual invention strands within that are the ones that you want to protect, and you might have to, uh, they call it, divide the application in the future so that you end up with several applications to protect different things within it. Um, but generally, the patent system does work on the fact that sort of when you file something, that's the date for that, and you can't in the future go back and say, well, actually, um, I wish I'd filed that. Um, I wish I'd filed something different. Um, the material has to be in there at the start. Um, it's a, it's a big area um, on the pharmaceutical side that sort of uh, at what stage do you file, at what stage is your invention, uh, the buzzword is plausible, um, that sort of it, it will actually work. Um, uh, have you got enough data and that's the decisions you're making is sort of at what point do we think we've got enough that this is going to stand up um, in the future. Okay, thanks. Maybe one quick question or so. Yep. Hi, um, I'm employed by one of the local startups who's working, we are working towards a speech recognition and there's a lot of innovation that we're doing as I suppose it's, it's a very mature industry. Um, I've been employed with these guys um, for about six months. So the time you sign the contract, any in innovation that you come up with belongs to the company. Now, you know, you come up, you know, you think about many things, you, you think about come up with new innovations that you work with privately, but where do you actually draw the line between the innovation that you come up with personally or um, the innovation that you, that, you, that you come up with when, when you're at work. But it seems like that having worked with many employers, you sign up these contracts and automatically any innovation that you, that you come up with, it belongs to the company. Um, is, th is, there a, is there a line that we draw? Between? Uh, yes, yes, there is. There's a line drawn in, in, in law that says that uh, essentially those type of agreements uh, are, cannot go beyond the extent of the, the law in relation to employee inventions. Um, and the sort of the basic line there between what's your employer's and what's private is what would you be expected in the normal course of your duties as an employee to come up with as inventions. And if you take the very extreme example, you're working at a pharmaceutical company, you're, you're developing new drugs, you're researching um, new drugs, and at your, in, in your garden shed at home, you're developing a new cat flap. Um, that new cat flap is not something you'd be expected to do whilst you work doing your day job on pharmaceuticals. So that cat flap is yours, but anything that you were to do, in, even if you were to do it outside of your time with your employer in relation to pharmaceuticals, they might well have a valid claim on. I'm doing that right now. I'm a composer. I don't think by dance own my compositions. Um, be annoying if they did, though. I must check that. <laughs> um, they'd get my £10 royalty checks. That would be a very good line of business for them. Um, yes, good to know. Something to check, maybe. Yes, perhaps. Uh, well, okay. First of all, thanks. I think we're going to finish it here. Uh, thanks for everyone for joining us. If you do have any more questions, please join us in the foyer now for the networking event. And please, everyone, uh, join me in thanking our distinguished uh, speakers, Stephen, Michal, Ed and Malcolm uh, for their time and for also sharing their views on this hot topic that everyone's so interested about. Thank you.